farming and ranching, they also did anything else they could do to make money, including um, logging and a little bit of mining. When I turned five, I came down with hay fever. And I put up with it until just short of my eighth birthday when I went into one of these family-owned coal mines <clears throat> and found there was no pollen underground. <laughs> it was a great revelation to me, and for a few years I literally lived underground <clears throat> because I could wake up in the morning without my throat itching and my eyes swelled shut. Once I found that out, then I fell in love with the mysteries of the dark mine tunnels, the machinery. I had one of the biggest toy trains, you might say, of all my friends, push around underground, and the people. And I always did appreciate the people because they were a neat bunch. Uh, a lot of characters, uh, you think about the characters in Butte, well, these people that I <laughs> I can't say I grew up with, that, that kind of brought me along, uh, were characters too. They, they were pretty distinct, and all of them were born in the 1800s. So they actually saw the transitions that I'm going to be talking about today from the days of hard, hardcore mining by hand up to the modern machine age. Um, Civilization is measured by the use of mined products. The Stone Age, the first guy who picked up a rock for any purpose was a miner. From there we went to the Copper Age, and the reason copper was so useful is because there was a lot of native copper laying around. And you can pass that chunk around. Copper has the advantage of being soft enough to be hammered into a shape. And you can see how they made a lot of utensils and tools out of copper. The next step was bronze as they learned that they could melt copper and probably starting out with naturally occurring alloys of tin and zinc, they found bronze and brass, which were harder than copper, made better tools. Oh, and that might be a good idea. Let's see how we Some of the, some of the slides are yeah. supposed to get the little arrow up the slide show up there. Yeah, where's the slide uh, show? Up here? at the top, the tab from the home, the from the tab, home insert design animation slideshow. All I got to do is. Uh... You got to use the pad. That's your, there you go. Let's try that. And let's see, from current slide, would that be it, Nancy? Yeah, I guess so, yeah. Start slide show right underneath it. There we go. There we go. Yay. Yay. Thank you. Thank you, Nance. The advent of the Iron Age with the discovery of high enough temperatures to melt iron ores, then we really got into the tool business. We got past where uh, you could, couldn't do much of anything because your tool got dull so fast that now the Iron Age, we're rocking and rolling. Mm -hmm. Just before the Civil War, they invented the process for making cheap steel. The Bessemer process is the slide on the left. And of course, that led to the steel head frames in Butte. Not to mention a lot of the steel construction that we're just take for granted today. Brooklyn Bridge, skyscrapers, trains, that sort of thing. And the concurrent event, invention that a lot of people don't think about was almost exactly the same time they figured out how to make modern concrete. So that was the beginning of modern construction. And of course, the ingredients for concrete, limestone and gypsum, have to be mined. Up until this time, the uh, 
Well, let's go on. Let's go on one more here. The new copper age, of course, we're all familiar with in Butte. The invention of the telegraph before the Civil War, the telephone, the electric light, and electric motors. The electronic age started about 1910 when they started figuring out ways to use the higher energy uh, electricity, um, enabled the Three Stooges to do an X-ray, uh, the early radio stations, TV stations, and there's quite a few people here that I imagine remember the old tube-type car radios. And the first computers were all tubes. They actually had a crew of people who did nothing but change tubes in the process of doing one calculation. Wow. Mm. Now we live in the silicon age with the invention of the transistor in the early 50s. We've got chips, computers, televisions, and solar. Up until the Industrial Revolution, which took place around oh, 16, 1700, with the invention of the steam engine, pretty much, um, consumers really weren't consumers. They were just people dealing with people. If you didn't produce what you need, you bartered for it. And not many people lived in the cities compared to out in the country. There was poor transportation and mostly one-on-one -on -one marketing, and everything was hand production. Clothes, everything was hand production. Then, from the Industrial Revolution up to the Steel Age, <clears throat> we had greatly improved transportation. The invention of the steam engine uh, led to way better transportation and also powering the increased demand for buying the products. In the post-steel age, of course, now we've developed a system where because a lot of the factories were the centers for towns and cities, where people live inside an area they couldn't raise their own food, they had to buy almost everything they used. In the, uh, this is from a book called De Re Metallica, which was written in the mid-1500s, and it kind of shows how mining was done before the invention of gunpowder. Oddly enough, gunpowder was invented about 1200 AD, but it took them three centuries to figure out that it might be useful in mining. So this poor slob that you see down here is covering his eyes because he's choking to death because he's lit this wood on fire against the face of the ore that he wants to mine. He's got extra wood there. He has to go back and keep piling it on. You can imagine what the air was like. Eventually, the rock gets hot enough, and one or two other guys come running in with buckets of cold water and they throw it on the rock, which immediately explodes. <laughs> yeah, when you talk about mining being a tough profession, that is it. <laughs> As they develop deeper mines and better machinery, and, and all this time, the demand for mine products is increasing because they need the iron. They need the coal to smelt the iron. They need the coal to heat the homes in the cities because people can't just go out and get wood anymore. So this is a device to hoist both water and ore from out of a mine shaft. You've got a water supply coming in at the top. Whoops. that dumps water down, and this guy's got a couple of levers, but he can make that water wheel go one direction or the other. This was high technology in the mid-1500s. <laughs> Once Newcomen invented the first steam engine, then they built massive pumps to pump the mines as they got deeper. You can see a man over here for scale to give you an idea how big this piece of iron is. <coughs> There were, <coughs> was equipment, especially in the Anaconda smelter in the early days, with flywheels that big. This was all transported and set up by hand. This was the first locomotive built, which was built for mine use. 
Again, got to get that coal out of the ground, get it transported to some place where it can be used. Back to everybody's got this impression about mining being this tough, horrible life. This was farming back in the day. You imagine being out in the plains of eastern Montana or Nebraska or somewhere, and that's what you've got to look forward all day, to rain or shine, whatever. And maybe you made a buck, maybe you just made enough to keep your family going, or maybe you killed off a couple of family members and went back east. <laughs> Mining was nothing. This is the kind of ship that a lot of the immigrants to America came in. Most of them came in steerage, which is this layer right here, just above the sump and the storage and everything else. And a lot of them came as stowaways down in the cargo hold at the bottom. This is how they were packed in there. <coughs> they didn't have the shuffleboard and the swimming pool and all that. <laughs> These poor people, all they had for sanitation was buckets. It was up to them to carry those buckets up to the top, dump them over the edge. Uh, you can imagine what this system worked like in rough seas. <laughs> Probably for what most of these people could afford was not the steam liners that started plying the Atlantic in the late 1800s, but in sailing ships. And it was a two week or better voyage over. So, yeah, I mean, it's a whole different world than we know today. The Industrial Revolution was metallurgy, machine tools, and power all of a sudden ramped up and started what we regard as modern civilization. Um, this also, as I mentioned, began a steep upward development, coal and iron mining, and also of valuable um, gems, gold, silver, to help pay for all this. But in a country like Sweden, Sweden was nothing until they developed their iron deposits. And then they became one of the major iron sources for Europe because of their mining. This is an interesting picture because when you look at all the pictures that you've probably all seen of underground mining, they look like this. In half a second, everything is pitch black. The only light for these guys to hammer with is that little flame right there. And, you know, in those days, this is a miner's candlestick from back in the day. Miner's cigarette, right? Miner's cigarette. <laughs> <laughs> Most people don't know that the Bic was invented in Butte. <laughs> There's your light. It's got a point on it so you can stick it in a crack in the rock or timber. It's got a hook so you can hang it from a rock or a timber. But if this room was pitch black, you'd realize how dark, how little light that gives. And just imagine being that guy and trusting your partner enough to turn that steel and hold it while he's swinging that nine pound hammer. <coughs> you talk about cojones of steel, they have them, man. <laughs> this, we're getting to Butte now. This is a sign that was posted underground in Butte from probably the 1890s up through maybe the 1930s, I don't know. It's a no smoking sign that's in 16 languages plus English. And I've got them listed there as near as we can figure out today. Dick Gibson and I are still arguing over a couple of them. <laughs> but this gives you an idea of the melting pot of people which gets down to what I'm really talking about and uh, 
Ed Vanderhoff and I are on a committee to do a tour of Butte, and I've been talking to them about the romance of mining, which was actually the title of a book by a mining engineer who was very famous at the end of the 19th century. And the romance of mining is really the stories beneath the story. We've all heard the Copper King stories and ethnic stories and the mine stories, but underneath all of those is our people, real live people. Might as well start with the Copper Kings. They really got us going here. Marcus Daly was the oldest. Well, you know, I'll take that back. He wasn't. He was the second one here. Uh, Clark, of course, came here originally to Virginia City, Bannock. He, he worked his way up from nothing to become what he was. And he's kind of taken a beating in all of the published works. He was an amazing guy. You, you could say that any of these three are in the same category as Einstein. These were brilliant, brilliant men. Clark had the eye for opportunity. And I'm sure that he probably deserved a lot of his hard case reputation <coughs> as an opportunist. But at that point in time, why wait? Why miss it? So you look at his career, he started the first, got the, the quartz mill in Butte finance. We let the guy run it for a while. He wasn't doing any good. He took it over and figured out the process to make it work. This is a person figuring these things out. And from there, he moved on up to acquire the properties <coughs> that he owned. He and Heinze get really interesting in the War of the Copper Kings because here they are fighting it out tooth and tong with daily and amalgamated copper and they're both developing whole new properties outside of you, hundreds of miles from you. Clark was developing Jerome, Arizona, the United Verde Mine, which probably made him more money than Butte. Most everybody knows he founded Las Vegas as part of that. But to build the railroads and all the things that he did and still manage the War of the Copper Kings, all these properties in Montana, he was a hell of a guy. Daly, most everybody knows the Daly story because his monument is Anaconda. He came in as a young man. He was only 30 when he first came to Butte. Um, he was sent here by the Walker brothers to look at the Alice Mine, all history from there, bought the Anaconda, and the interesting thing is he carved himself out a piece of that. He only had an actual 25% interest in the original Anaconda Copper Mining Company because he depended on other people for the money. Well, of course, then he was approached by Standard Oil, Rockefeller, and Rogers. If you want a villain in Butte, Rogers is the villain. Rogers was a man who cared nothing about anything but how much money he could make. Now, Marcus Daly was, had a short life. He only lived to 1900. He just barely sold out. And he was dead. My favorite of the three is F. Augustus Heinze. Heinze was 30 years younger than the other two. He came to Butte in 1889 when he was 20 years old. He went to work for one of the mining companies for $250 a month, which was a lot of money. The miners were making around $100 a month. So he was doing all right. He worked for the companies. He was very, very short. Saw the opportunities. He figured out a lot of the vein systems. He went, saw that the need in Butte was for an economical smelter for the smaller producers. 
He went to Germany, he took a crash course in metallurgy, he came back to Butte, he acquired the properties, he put the infrastructure together, he built the Montana ore purchasing smelter, and he blew that smelter in, which means he started that smelter a month after his 24th birthday. What were any of you doing when you were 24? <laughs> It's incredible when you think about it, and, and when you talk about these guys traveling around, you know, travel wasn't jump on the airplane in those days. It took days and weeks to get anywhere, especially to Europe. Heinze got everything going in Butte. He gets interested in British Columbia. He goes to British Columbia and does everything he did in Butte, plus build a railroad. Turns around and sells it out. Comes back in time to sell out to Amalgamated. Go to New York, create the crash in 1907, and die. <laughs> uh, it's just incredible to think about these guys, you know. And and while we're uh, we're talking about the wages and whatnot, whatever I did with my glasses, you got to factor in inflation, which is a pretty interesting thing. The miner's making $100 a month, $4 a day, however many days they worked. The inflation factor is 44 times since then. So they were making around $4,400 a month. If you use gold, which is interesting too, the price of gold is 65 times what it was in those days. So now all of a sudden those miners are making $6,500 a month. Modern miners on a bonus system are making around $7,000. So they weren't really being exploited as badly as you think they were. Especially when you compare their work to the farmers that I showed you or the average shopkeeper working in town <coughs> who might be making $20 a month, if that. Mining was well paid. Yes, it was hard work. It was dangerous. In the days before modern ventilation and dust control and everything, uh, it was a tough life. In the Butte mines, what we call the geothermal gradient, how hot the earth gets as you go deeper, is about two degrees per hundred feet. So when you talk about the Mountain Con mine being a mile deep, you're talking about being the bottom of it being 100 degrees hotter than the average temperature, which at this latitude is 44 degrees. Mm. When I was a student at the School of Mines, uh, I worked at a lot of places where the, the wall temperature was 138 degrees. <coughs> and you'd go into a working place, and if you were lucky, you could work 15 minutes and then you'd run back out to the end of the ventilation duct to breathe that cool air for half an hour. And that's all that was expected of you. In addition to the geothermal gradient, the butte ores are sulfide ores, which as soon as they're exposed, they start to oxidize, just like they roasted them on the heaps that most of you are familiar with that created the smoke in butte. And when they oxidize, they can actually get hot enough when they're with the the roasting heaps were rock that was on fire. Burning rock, and this happened underground too. The temperature is so hot, they would timber next to this rock, and the rock would heat up to the point of being above four or 500 degrees and start the timber on fire, which would then be the added heat necessary to start the rock on fire. Um, Ventilation was very important. The, uh, the only thing that saved a lot of miners from being gassed to death was the fact that they were using candles and later carbide lamps, which told them whether they had oxygen or not. Um, when I was a student working there, I had thick glasses on in those days, and the fog was so thick you couldn't see anything anyway. You're talking about 100 degrees temperature average and 100% humidity. My glasses had fogged up so bad I couldn't see anything. If I took them off, I was blind too. Uh, but it was a tough life. But they were paid well. And the big
big thing that a lot of people don't understand is mining is as much or more of a craft as anything else. Brick laying, carpentry, you name any craft, machine. Um, miners are experts at their work and they take a lot of pride in it. And sometimes I think that gets lost in the modern interpretations, especially now that it's been almost two generations since there were underground miners in Butte. Buck O'Donnell was a Butte miner. Um, he liked to draw sketches, and uh, he's quite well known in the mining industry. This gives you an idea of what it was like to work in the Butte mines. These guys, you can see this guy is dumping out a boot full of water. Most of them are stripping down. They're hand shoveling that rock into the mine car. And again, all by candlelight. Here's how they sunk the shafts in Butte. Water is pouring down from above. Water's flooding up from below. You've got a couple of compressed air drills running here, which is a terrible racket. And more than likely, you've got a steam pump running somewhere in the same small area. All the Butte shafts in the rock are only about 8 feet by 15 feet, or 20 feet. So it's a real small space. So this makes it look brighter and wider and everything than it was. And this is the best part. <laughs> Talk about hardship. This is the toilet car tucked away in some side drift. And if you were the unlucky person who made the shift boss mad, sometime during the week it was your job to empty it. Yeah, that's right. It wasn't all tough. Here's the mule in the mine. My sweetheart's a mule in the mine. My driver with only one line. On the dashboard I sit, and tobacco I spit all over my sweetheart's behind. <laughs> the mules were very, very smart. You can see he doesn't even have a line on the mule. The mule knew the routes. They knew their level. Uh, they would only pull so many cars. There's, there's a lot of stories. Here's what we call raise mining back in the day of hand drilling. Uh, it's bad enough when these guys were drilling that way or drilling down. These guys had to swing a hammer up to hit the steel. All of the rock cuttings fall out of the hole literally right in their faces. The butte granite is a fair percentage of quartz. The quartz never comes out of your lungs again. This is the start of the famous silicosis. They invented the buzzy drill or the widow maker about 1895. This again was a dry drill and in bad ground especially. The miner was close enough to that to make love to that drill. And the dust is falling right in his face. This drawing actually minimizes that a little bit. Most of the holes were up out of reach here. So that dust is he's just constantly in that cloud of dust. And he's tough. The interesting thing about this is the wet drilling process was developed about 1900. And up until World War II, all the major manufacturers were still offering a choice between the dry and wet drill. Not because the companies demanded it, because the miners demanded it. Hmm. The miners would rather be in a cloud of dust than have muddy water poured down on them. Miners are kind of short-sighted sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Here you can see the drill steel. I've got a sample of the drill steel out of that picture right here. This is what we call cruciform steel. It's shaped like a cross. It's shipped in bars. They cut it to length. And the blacksmiths would heat the end in a forge and take hammers. I think I have a picture here. With this dolly. And that would form the sharp bit on the end of the drill steel. Hand forges. There were, for every miner, Every 10 miners, there was probably a blacksmith on the Butte Hill. Can't have a forge underground because of the combustion gases and the heat. 
So all of the drill steel used in the mines had to be transported from the blacksmith shop into the mines, distributed to the different working places, dulled, which might happen really quickly. Uh, a lot of these blacksmiths were not the sharpest drill in the mine. <laughs> so sometimes they, you might run a, a, a drill bit for five minutes and it's too dull to drill. Anyway, in the end there was a fleet of nippers, which were mostly high school kids, who went down in the mines and gathered up all this drill steel. And it's not like walking across the floor. A lot of these working places were a hundred feet off the haulage level. These kids that have to go up, bring all this steel down, put on mine cars, take it to the shaft, hoist it to the surface. Uh, there's a couple of incidents where there were terrible, terrible accidents of these kids riding up with the drill steel and a piece of drill steel drifting out into the timber mm -hmm. and just scrambling. I estimated that when the Butte mines were really running, in every single day there was around 500 tons of drill steel hoisted and lowered in the mines. You can imagine the amount of work that was and just sheer effort. In 1918, a very bright machinist in Butte, Al Hawksworth, developed the first removable bit. It's got a dovetail joint here. You can kind of see the picture up there. So that the cutting edge can be knocked off and a miner can go underground with just a pocket full of these bits. All the drill steel stays there. Huge saving. The other advantage to the Hawksworth bit is it can be put on massive machines that would sharpen thousands of them an hour. Hawksworth patented his bit. The Anaconda Company supported his efforts. Um, up by the Bell Diamond, there was what became known in later years as the Hawksworth Yard, where these bits were manufactured and shipped all over the world. Hawksworth died before the later bits came along, which were a much simpler threaded connection. And, but to Hawksworth and Butte goes credit for saving a lot of lives, a lot of work with the detachable bit. Even with the detachable bit, it's just an ordinary steel cutting edge, so a miner would go through 10 or 15 bits in a shift. Still a lot of bits packed back and forth, but the nippers were out of work, so they had to figure out some other way to break into mining. This is a modern drill bit. It's got tungsten carbide inserts in it, which are very hard, and this bit is all the miner needs for up to a week of drilling. These early drills were what called slugger drills, very, very heavy, very slow. The whole drill bit went back and forth into the hole. If they couldn't add water to it, then there's more dust being generated. In 1900, the guy that I was talking about that invented wet drilling developed a hammer drill, and he sold 400 of them in Colorado. The miners took them and hated them because they were way dustier than the existing drills. They blew the cuttings out with compressed air. He took them all back and he invented a way to put a water tube through the middle of the drill to inject water to the cutting face. He saved thousands and thousands of miners' lives. It was an amazing invention. The same guy also invented a mechanical machine to sharpen the drill bits and form these cutting edges. Brilliant. Another one of those brilliant guys. The mining <coughs> families, Butte, Butte communities. Most of these people started out as immigrants. And the ethnicity <coughs> of the neighborhoods, they're all famous in Butte. But the guys that were working underground, um, you always had a partner underground. And your partner underground was more important for 8 or 10 or 12 hours that you were working than your family. 
most of the time underground, you never gave your family a thought. You were looking out after your partner. <coughs> On the surface, the wives are waiting, and most of them are just like all of you. They have no clue of what their husbands actually do for a job. A lot of guys didn't come out and talk about it. Every day was a little bit of post-traumatic stress syndrome. They'd go out and unwind. That's why there were so many bars in Butte. And the kids knew even less than the, parents, the mothers did. But they knew that their fathers were doing the same thing. They knew how worried their mothers were. God forbid that the whistles at the mine should blow any time but the shift change. You can just imagine if you're just in the back of your mind waiting for something to happen to the old man and that whistle goes off at 1.30 in the afternoon and keeps blowing, something happened. The uh, Granite Mountain Fire was, of course, the worst mining, hard rock mining disaster in the world. And, but it was, it was just a bigger version of a lot of smaller accidents. I'd like to go back to uh, talking about the lighting underground. I've got a carbide lamp. I imagine there's a lot of you here probably never seen a carbide lamp actually burn. Let's see if we can do it. Come on. This is about 20 times lighter than the light from a candle. It's got a reflector on it so you can actually aim the light at what you're working on. Um, it's got solid chunks of calcium carbide in the bottom. The upper part is a water tank, drips a little water onto it, forms acetylene gas. Big, 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 big jump forward. I'll leave it burning. It's quite stinky when they go on. <laughs> the loss, of course, accidents, <coughs> and silicosis. An old miner, up until probably World War II, was probably in his 40s. Um, not from the work, but mostly from silicosis. Of course, building up in your lungs and eventually just plain smothering to death. This is the only real picture that a lot of the mining families had of what their husbands did underground. This is a drilling contest. Block of granite under the ground, platform for the guys to work on. Let me look at my notes here to get the facts right. <coughs> Oh yeah, the glasses part again. <laughs> In August 18th, 1907, a couple of miners from Bisbee, Arizona, won a purse of $1,250 they wow. drilled 45 and 31 30 seconds inches, double jacking like that in hard ground. $1,250, big deal. Well, inflation, that's $50,000. Price of gold is $81,250. They did it in front of a crowd of 25,000 people. <coughs> the world's record for hand drilling is held by Walter Bradshaw and Joe Freethy of Butte, Montana, mm -hmm. who drilled 55 inches in Spokane in 1901. Mm -hmm. Never been equal. Wow. In how long? 15 minutes. Oh, wow. 15 minutes. These guys were so good, they're swinging this hammer 60 to 90 times a minute, and they would change. One guy's down here holding the steel, and he has to rotate a little bit. 
He has a bucket of water over here that he adds a little bit of water so the cuttings will splash out and won't bind the pit. The guy hammering could bring the hammer down on the drill steel. His partner would take that hammer over before it ever had a chance to fall off the drill steel. They could change that fast. Very, very impressive to watch. Good old hand drilling. There's, there's a drilling contest stone in one of the cemeteries here. You see them around, but uh, next time you see one, think of the work that went into that. And that's just a demonstration. This was every day. Every working day, they were pounding on that drill steel. <coughs> Here's the after work part. <laughs> it's an absolute fact that there was more ore broken and shipped in the deep bars than ever in the mine. <laughs> and the ultimate consequence of breaking all that ore in the bars is eventually they got to go home. The buried miners in a lot of ways had it better, and their wives probably had it worse, than the single miners. Uh, back in the day, there were so many boarding houses in Butte because the miners, especially when they were working 10, 12-hour shifts, they walked to work, they went down and worked in these 100-degree temperatures or better, came out and walked home. No refrigeration, no central heat, no grocery stores, no fast food. Everything had to be done every single day. The wives, you think about being a wife in those days. Man, kids, laundry, had to go shopping every single day, had to cook every single day. We can't imagine what it's like, you know. And, and I guess for me, the way I grew up around these people who had a much simpler life, you know. We, we didn't have indoor plumbing. We didn't have electricity until I was 12 years old. And it gives you an appreciation for what it must have been like in Butte. Horses and mules travel the streets all the time. Everybody today would be puking their guts up <laughs> from the smell. Even on a clear day when the smelter smoke was being blown away, there was still garbage running down the streets. There was still all the animals going up and down the streets. It's a whole different world. We're just a a bunch of sissies now. <laughs> I, I look at, at the, the oil spill in Glendive. Well, in the first place, what are you going to do to hurt Glendive, Montana? <laughs> They're already drinking the water that's downstream from at least 15 sewage disposal plants. All the agriculture, all the wild animals that are dumping in that river, and they're worried about a little oil. <laughs> People that get concerned about Butte's drinking water, Butte's drinking water is a thousand, a million times better than it was. People build up natural resistances to things that were in the water. Now, if we had a cholera outbreak, everybody would die on the spot. <laughs> anyway, oh yeah, I was going to show you this. This is, uh, this is a modern mine lamp. This is 15 hours worth of lighting. And it's pretty good. Um, when you hear about the accidents in Butte, the thing that everybody ignores is the lighting, as I've mentioned, was really bad. But you look at the macho image of miners and think how few of them wore glasses if they were nearsighted. By candlelight, if you're working in a, in a stove, which is a, where you're mining the ore, and that ceiling, or the back as we call it, is out of reach, you can't even see if there's a loose rock there by candlelight, especially if you're nearsighted. And, and people are horrified by the accident incidents in Butte, but when you look at the real circumstances, it's just absolutely remarkable that there weren't more. And when you read the old-time mine inspector's reports, 
of the mine inspector trying to institute safety measures in Butte. The cages that went up and down the shafts were nothing more than a platform, a couple of rods holding up to a guide on the top, no doors, no bars, nothing. And these guys would get six or nine people on that cage and being miners, they're playing grab ass all the way up and down. And, and the mine inspector said, we need doors on these cages to keep them from getting hurt. The miners union fought that tooth and nail. The miners union did. And I've never seen an explanation for that. I have no idea why they would do that. This chunk of rock is a piece of calcasite, which is the ore that Marcus Daly started out shipping to Wales. This is 72% copper. Um, this sample is from the Broadway Victoria Mine at Silver Star. I was able to have a little piece of history in that we, like Marcus Daly, took this ore shoveled it out of the mine into containers and shipped it direct to China. And this is a chunk of lead zinc ore from Butte. Butte is a remarkable ore deposit in that copper is just part of it. Of course, Molly, in, in some ways, uh, Montana Resources is more of a molybdenum mine than a copper mine. Uh, thank God for that, uh, and it's remarkable what they do now. When Marcus Daly was mining on the Anaconda and the Never Sweat, he was mining copper ore that was better than 10% copper by the time it got out of the ground. Right now, Montana Resources is mining ore that's 0.18% copper. In other words, 3.6 pounds of copper per ton and about uh, a little better than uh, two pounds of molybdenum, I think. It's pretty remarkable the changes that have been made. Um, you talk about the old stamp mills. Everybody, oh, there was a hundred stamp mill here. Well, the stamp mill only crushed about a ton and a half of rock in 24 hours. So a big mine was 150 tons a day. Montana Resources, by the time you include the waste, is mining around 150,000 tons a day. And again, it's all based on people. People do the mining. And one of the things that I'd really like to do is get people more aware of the people part of mining. So I appreciate your attention. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Hey Larry, could you just real quick tell us about the miners' dries? When they were put in, when did they actually start putting the dries in? And what, how did the, the miners cope before that? Well, the miners just came out in their diggers and walked home. I mean, they came out of 100 degree temperatures, and the air, ventilation air going down the shafts is approaching 70 to 100 miles an hour by the time it fits around the people and the cages and everything. So when it's 40 below zero in Butte, coming out in the shafts, and then walking home was tough duty, really tough duty. The tries really weren't instituted until the 1920s. And the same way with the hoisting engineers. These are the guys who've got the whole crew in their hands, and they're standing on a platform in a big room that's sweltering hot in the summer and freezing cold in the winter. It's, you know, yeah, 